Hello everybody, your 101 instructor back again with another short video lecture, this time on seafloor spreading. So in the last lecture that I created, uh, we discussed the meteorologist Alfred Wegener and his hypothesis of continental drift. And we talked about how uh, geomagnetism allowed us to figure out that in fact, the continents had to be moving relative to one another. And so he was fundamentally correct about that. Um, what we still don't really know, however, is what process or what mechanism allows the continents to move. Um, and so that's where seafloor spreading comes in. So to begin today's story, we really need to go back to World War II and the passage of big U-boats all around the world's oceans. Um, one of the pieces of equipment that was being towed behind these ships at the time uh, were sonar. And so sonar allows a ship to easily measure the depth to the seafloor from beneath the ship. So they send out a little ping, it bounces off the seafloor and returns to the ship. And however long that takes tells you how deep the ocean is at that point. If it takes a long time, it's really deep. If it takes a short time, it's not so deep. And so in doing that, um, we were inadvertently able to map the seafloor. Of course, this was done to detect other, other boats, um, other submarines, but um, what we got out of it was a bathymetric map of the seafloor. So bathymetry simply refers to the depth beneath the surface of the seafloor. Uh, what's shown here is a bathymetric profile across the Atlantic Ocean. And the first thing that should pop out at you is that the oceans are not flat. They have features. They go up and down. The floor of the oceanic crust goes up and down, making the oceans shallow and deep in uh, various places. Um, the second thing that should pop out at you is this feature of, in the middle of the oceans where the um, ocean is not deep or where there's a bathymetric high. That is called the um, mid-ocean ridge. So in the uh, cross section, you can see it right here. And in the map view, it's this thing that is kind of cutting across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, also discovered, thanks to sonar, were other interesting features on the seafloor like guillotes, which are flat-topped volcanoes and um, really deep abyssal plains. We also discovered that the ocean has these huge trenches in them, um, sea mounts, all sorts of um, really neat features. So the ocean floor, even though we can't see it, of course, um, is full of features, and we know that thanks to um, original sonar detection. Because of that sonar, we were able to construct bathymetric maps of the entire globe. So you should see here that the oceans are not all one shade of blue. Um, there are various shades of blue. The darker the blue, the greater the depth to the seafloor, which you could also say is the deeper the ocean. Um, notice that in all of the world's oceans, there are these light colored stripes that run down the middle of the oceans. Um, those are what you will soon learn are mid ocean ridges. Here's the mid Atlantic Ridge. Here's the one in the Pacific Ocean, which is called the East Pacific Rise. It's called that because it's actually situated on the Eastern side of the Pacific Ocean, not right down the middle. Um, but all of the world's oceans have these. It's pretty spectacular. Here's one here. Um, also notable is that a distribution of the earthquakes in the globe, so if you just plot them everywhere that there's been large earthquakes uh, on our planet, you can see that the earthquakes align with those features in the oceans. Um, so again, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is also delineated by this belt of earthquakes. That's pretty cool. So the discovery of these bathymetric features, the ridges and things um, and trenches, together with other important characteristics of the seafloor, allowed, um, allowed us to set the stage for the discovery of seafloor spreading, which was really done by a scientist named Harry Hess, and that's who's in the picture. Um, I want to make a note here that your textbook has these little blue boxes um, that are periodically interspersed throughout the chapters. They're called take home messages. If you only have time to skim the chapter of your text, I suggest looking 
carefully at the figures, particularly those that we talk about in class, and reading these take-home messages. They're great summaries of the most salient points in your text. So in addition to the sea floors having ridges and trenches and things like that, and to those ridges and trenches coinciding with the distribution of global earthquakes, there were a few additional puzzle pieces that helped to construct this idea of seafloor spreading. The first is that sediment or um, loose unconsolidated bits of rock and mud, um, it thickened, that, that blanket of stuff that was raining down onto the seafloor, that blanket thickens as you go away from the mid-ocean ridges. So it's a very thin blanket at the ridges and very thick in the deep oceans. We were also able to detect heat flow and found that there's very high heat flow at the mid-ocean ridges um, and the oceans are very cold as you move away from the ridges. These suggested to Harry Hess that the ridges had magma or molten rock underneath them that were producing that high heat flow, and they were very young, such that they had not been covered by a lot of sediment, but that as you moved away from the ridges, the oceanic floor became older and colder and covered with more sediment. And so this really sets up this idea of the seafloor spreading apart being filled in by rising magma, and then moving away to the sides where it can cool and collect that thicker veneer of sediment. In addition to towing sonar, U-boats uh, during World War II and, and many other boats since, as we've come to discover this and want to learn more about it, have towed behind them not just sonar equipment, but also magnetometers. When this was first done in World War II, uh, there was a surprising result. And that result was that the magnetometers revealed alternating strong and weak magnetic fields as they were pulled across the ocean floor. And so this creates um, what is sometimes called a barcode pattern, where you've got this um, positive anomalies and negative anomalies. Now, what do I mean by a magnetic anomaly? A magnetic anomaly is simply the difference between the expected strength of the Earth's main dipole field and the actual measured strength. So we've discussed how the Earth has a magnetic field thanks to the liquid outer core. And so therefore, there are, um, there is a kind of inherent background magnetism that can be recorded anywhere you go on planet Earth. That's how compass needles work. Um, however, as the magnetometer got dragged across the seafloor, what was determined was that in some places, the magnetism that was measured was actually stronger than the background magnetism of planet Earth. That would be a positive anomaly. And in some cases, the magnetism was, magnetism, excuse me, was weaker that would be considered a negative anomaly. So what was causing that? Well, positive anomalies are created because the basalt rock that makes up the oceanic crust in some places in the ocean was produced during a normal magnetic event in the earth. And therefore it adds to the background magnetism that we experience today. Other basalts of the seafloor were cooled and solidified during a period in the Earth's past when the magnetic field was reversed. So that's a funny thing. Earth's magnetic field can flip back and forth. Now the poles are always near the geographic poles of our planet, so they're almost always, um, these bar magnets are almost always pointed up and down. But you can see that the polarity of that bar magnet can change from time to time. And this happens in the Earth randomly and uh, regularly over time. So the spacing of the reversal intervals is not um, always the same. But the Earth does flip-flop back and forth between normal polarity and reverse polarity. So if a basalt cools and crystallizes during a time when you have normal polarity, 
then when you go and you drag a magnetometer across that basalt, what you're reading is the normal polarity of the basalt plus the normal polarity of the Earth today. And therefore you get a positive magnetic anomaly, stronger than expected. If the basalt, however, crystallized during a reversed polarity field, then you would get a reversed basalt, and that would take away, at least in part, from the Earth's normal field. So you would get a negative anomaly because it would subtract from Earth's magnetic field, and therefore the oceanic crust that the magnetometer is being dragged over would record a negative anomaly. So here's a much less messy way of explaining that. Here's the Earth's ambient magnetic field. Here's the basalt of the seafloor that crystallized during a normal event, leading to addition of those two magnetic fields and a stronger than normal magnetism. However, if the seafloor crystallized during a reverse period, it is uh, it con counteracts some of Earth's normal magnetic field and a weak anomaly is produced. So let's go back to this scenario where we're looking at stacks of basalts in a cliff in Hawaii. We've already discussed how the magnetism, the declination and inclination recorded in those basalts changes over time. But you can also see in this picture that those basalts are recording different episodes of normal and reverse polarity. That's because again, Earth's magnetic field is flip-flopping back and forth during which time these basalts are being erupted and created. We can use that pattern to create a magnetic time scale for our planet. Um, so we know, for example, that the last reversal happened something like, oh, 700,000 years ago, something like that. And then there was a brief reverse period and a short normal period, and then it went back to reverse, and then it went back to normal. So you can see that these flip-flops between normal and reverse are somewhat irregular, but it's definitely something that our planet has been doing um, forever, as far as we know. These magnetic anomalies are symmetric across mid-ocean ridges. So here you've got the ridge axis in this kind of dashed orangey-yellow picture. Notice that on either side of the ridge, you've got normal zones followed by reversed zones. And they're the same on either side of the ridge axis, followed by normal zones here. So you can see that you're getting a mirror image on either side of the ridge. We use that to argue for this concept of seafloor spreading, that at first, during time one, so that would be this picture up here, you've got the oceanic um, sea floor that's made of basalt and it's being pulled apart to the side. Hot magma that's underneath rises up creating that high heat flow, cools to form basalt which would be this stuff right here and that basalt locks in whatever the magnetic field at the time is. Fast forward through time and that basalt which was my green line in the top picture is now out here. And now we've had a magnetic reversal and we're producing this basalt here next to the ridge. Fast forward in time again, and now you've got your um, normal, your old normal, which is out here. You've got that reversed. And now you've got a new normal that's forming right against the ridge, creating this symmetrical barcode pattern across the seafloor. So the seafloor is constantly spreading apart. New basalt is cooling and crystallizing along the ridge axis to make new seafloor. And then that cools and spreads apart. And therefore the oceans are becoming wider and wider and the continents are getting farther and farther apart from one another. So again, Here's one of these take home messages from your text. 
I recommend that you thumb through your chapters that I assign you and at a minimum, have a look at these take home messages. They do a really nice job of describing um, kind of the most important summary points um, of the different subsections of your text. And here's a thought question that I wanna uh, talk about when we meet together next week, and that is, why do we only have paleomagnetic information going back about 170 million years? You know that the Earth is about 4.55 billion years old. That's what GA means. So why is it that we only have a record of the paleomagnetism of the seafloor going back 170 million years? That's one question for you. And then lastly, I'd like to leave you with two other kind of quiz questions that we'll discuss together. So you can pause your video here and read this one. This is a question about the Earth's magnetic field and the polarity of Earth's magnetic field through time. And then secondly, a true-false question which asks you, as you move away from a mid-ocean ridge, oceanic crust becomes older, colder, and covered with more sediment. Is that true or false? Think about these questions and we will discuss together when I see you next. Bye-bye.